Welcome to this edition of FEMFN and the House of Preeminence. This edition is a topic that we have not treated before in House of Preeminence. It is about relationships, but it is relationships in a bigger context as well as your own relationships. And it is my absolute honor to, to, be, to be inviting today one of the most outstanding transformational leaders that, that is in the world today. She is a New York Times bestselling author of Calling in the One and Conscious, Conscious Uncoupling, and she's going to talk to you about that. She is also an expert for Titan, giant education platform, Mind Valley. She has shared the stage with some extraordinary leaders uh, peer leaders such as Marianne Williamson, Neil Donald Walsh, Mary Morrissey, and also um, Alanis Morissette. She has taught and influenced and inspired hundreds of thousands of people across the globe to find both find their love and to navigate beautifully and consciously through their relationships so but we're going to be giving this uh, a very very global current context today ladies because I know that this is what you are all focused on so it is my great pleasure to welcome Catherine Woodward Thomas thank you so much it's just a joy to be with you thank you for what you're doing I'm such a fan of yours. So I'm delighted to be here with you and with everyone. Thank you. Okay, so let's dive in, Catherine. The first thing that I, I was coming to me while, um, while I was, I was think, thinking about, about, about your work was, because we are the same generation, was how when we started our professional life, um, or, and even before that, when we when we were teenagers and, and kind of coming into our twenties, we were set with the idea that um, that there was going to be a one, a prince charming. He was out there somewhere, and that all we had to do was find him, figure out where he was, and you know, and get ourselves married, and that that would be happily ever after. And the idea of happily ever after was kind of we didn't even question it at that time in our lives. It was what our, uh, it was an ideal. Um, and we just went into that. Well, I don't know what statistics are. You probably know better than I what do what statistics are. I do know that I've I've been through divorce four times myself. So, <laughs> so, so I've been I've been right on the inside of this subject. Nevertheless, I just wanted to ask you if this dream is still alive and well and, and kicking and should we should we still believe in it or should we go beyond and and just know that there are all sorts of ways that we can we can have you know multi relationships beautiful question i think happily ever after is still cons i'm sorry that's my cat do you hear my cat <laughs> I'm not torturing somebody. She must, she must to it. <laughs> we call her an opera singer. So um, I think happily ever after is still kind of the pinnacle in our minds. It's the standard that we hold each other accountable to and ourselves certainly. So that when a relationship ends before one or both people die, we tend to automatically think of it as a failure. And uh, we tend to automatically feel ashamed or guilty. Um, and some of us have a very hard time getting over that heartbreak. But it's the, it's the meaning we make of the heartbreak too, that we have somehow failed, there's something wrong with us. So when I, when I got divorced after a decade of marriage to the man that I wrote about in Calling in the One, my beautiful husband, Mark, um, I, I noticed that I was feeling um, a sense of failure, a sense of shame, even though a big part of me felt like it was really the right thing, that the relationship had come to a place of completion and closure, that beautiful things had happened from that relationship. And it was really a conscious decision on our part. So I had these two parts of me and I got curious about the part of me that felt 
um, ashamed. I mean, obviously I'm a teacher of love and relationships, so you don't expect me to get a divorce because of the happily ever after myth. But I realized, okay, well, this is the ideal. And then I got curious, where does this come from? What is thinking me? Like whose ideal is this? So I started to research the happily ever after myth. And I found out that it's 400 years old and it was created in Venice, Italy, which is still the romance capital of the world. And it was created at a time where people were so desperate because the life conditions were so horrible. And if you notice in Happily Ever After, the, the um, protagonist always marries up into great wealth. So they, it's, you know, it's a real Cinderella story rags to riches. So there's that too, this up, this stand, this upward mobility, you know, and they all lived happily. So when I, when I realized that, that, you know, first of all, the lifespan was less than 40 when the myth was created and there was no mobility. If you, and there was a law on the books that if a noble person married a commoner, they, they, they actually, there was a law in the books that prevented a noble person for marrying a commoner. So if you were born into poverty, that was your expectation for your life. So we have to understand these kinds of uh, broad stroke memes that we're living into and where they come from. But these memes come out of the circumstances of our day. So when we, when we look at our modern day love, we see that serial monogamy is the new norm. You are the new norm, right? Because we're living long lives. We're sexual into our 70s and our 80s and go for it in our 90s, you know, with, with, the, with all sorts of expectations that we're going to live rich, full lives until it's our time to go. And now we're looking at, you know, there was a recent Time article. I know with the pandemic that the lifespan has lowered. But before the pandemic, we were on target for our children living to 120, 140. So you have to start to think intelligently. Here's the breakdown. We human beings are hardwired to connect. And we feel like we're going to die at the end of a relationship. And we go into primitive fight or flight. And we do not have the skills to navigate that. We do not have the inner development to navigate when we are really knee deep in there with someone and then we're betrayed, instinctively we go into fight or flight. And so a lot of us go to war, even conscious people go to war at the end of love, do horrible things that create very negative karma that set us up for diminished lives in the aftermath, certainly set other people up for diminished lives in the aftermath of the breakup. So I created conscious uncoupling to kind of map out the steps of conscious completion because it's not organic to us yet. My, my, any work that I do, and I know a lot of us feel the same way, we are a part of a chain of human becoming. And when we think back to like 500 years ago, the people we're thinking back to 500 years ago, they weren't like us back then they were they were they didn't have the development that we have if you even go back to the movies in the 40s you see that people were you know kind of overly simplistic from our perspective really lacking in complexity oh john i love you oh mary i love you too let's get married you know it was just kind of simple and sometimes in the complexity of our lives, we want to go back to that time. But there's something about evolution, which has a lot to do with holding more complexity. The ideals of love that we are living into now, which are love between equals, where both people are holding power, equal power, that's a brand new phenomenon on planet Earth. We have to understand how quickly love is evolving. The ideals of love are evolving. You know, if we look back to our grandmothers, our grandmothers were looking for someone who had a job, who didn't drink too much, and who smelled good. And that was basically her criteria for a husband. That was it. So we think about what we're looking for in a partner, what we expect, which is all great and beautiful and wholesome to want. 
but it's pushing on us to grow because we are not yet the people we will need to be in order to fulfill upon the longings of our heart. A best friend, someone who goes the long haul, someone who is our spiritual partner, someone to raise children with who is our equal financially or our superior, hopefully would not be nice. But, but you know, I'm just saying we have a lot of expectations. And so, and so a, a lot, much of the work that I'm doing is helping people to grow in the ways that we would need to grow. But here's the thing, you, you opened this talking about kind of the relationship between the, 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 the personal and the planetary. I don't know if we've gotten there yet. We certainly were talking about before we hit the record button. Yes, absolutely. Because you, because you, just, you just mentioned that we are not wired to get over the, the, the grief that we, li- that, we, that we die. I think that was what, what you said, that we, that we actually die. And but we feel like we're going feel to like die. We feel like right? we're going to die, yeah. Yeah. So if you if you wandered away from your tribe a thousand years ago, you might have died. That's what I mean by we're hardwired to connect. We're not actually hardwired to come apart. So nature hasn't caught up to our culture. But when we're talking about and and this is a beautiful conversation that you are leading this month on love. And, And we're having this conversation in the midst of global crises that are escalating and compounding. So there's not a separation between the striving for uh, wait to wake up and to grow our capacities to love and be loved, and what's happening in the world. But it, it, the, the personal is relevant to the planetary. So if we look at, for example, one of the reasons I am so devoted to training coaches and to continuing to teach conscious uncoupling is because we're learning the inner skills and the interpersonal skills. So they're called intrapersonal. So they're like self-soothing, making empowered meaning, uh, mentoring ourselves to more empowered meaning, even knowing what we feel and need, being responsible for our own state of consciousness. Those are all of the inner skills. And then, of course, we know the interpersonal skills, communication skills or resolving conflicts or negotiating our needs, all of these things. But most of us are not very strong in these areas. Setting boundaries would be another one. We're not very strong in how to keep love safe. And then there's also the components, things like how do you build trust? You know, a lot of us in the spiritual community, we have an ideal that uh, unconditional love is what we want to be bringing to our relationships. But here's the dilemma. uh, love is unconditional but relationships are not because relationships depend upon trust and trust is a conditional phenomenon you actually have to show up with integrity to build trust right so there's all this complexity now that that's really pushing on us to grow and when we're able to do it in our personal then there's hope for the planet you think about like even how hard it is for all of our, our all of our nations to come together to align upon a course of action to uh, de-escalate climate change right now. How hard is it for us to just agree, to join, to act in harmony? So we have to see our homes, our our children, our spouses, our lovers, our best friends. We have to see our capacity to do that and to overcome the obstacles, the areas of incompatibility, the hurts that we cause each other, the disappointments that we suffer, the betrayals, the many betrayals, all of those things. And how do we complete things in a peaceful way, in a conscious way, in a way that is um, forgiving of ourselves and each other and and future-focused, future-focused. So that we're not just constantly re-wounding one another in the same way that, you know, we were wounded in childhood, but we're actually using the setbacks and the obstacles and the disappointments and delays really as food to bounce, not just bounce back, but bounce forward in, in, in life and, and, in, and in all that we're up to. So is the, is the, is the, the soulmate 
a, a myth? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we have contracts with people. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times though, people think it's just about meeting the right person. And I think that all of us have had the experience of meeting an extraordinary, you know, love, calling in an extraordinary love, and then suffering greatly mm -hmm. because one or both of us was not mature enough, not complete with their past enough, still duplicating patterns of the past, unhealed, unconscious, unwell, not able to sustain the love that we had called in. But I also think that, um, so, so relationships, all relationships have a spectrum. And, you know, if you're, if you're in a relationship, you're on the hot seat to grow. If you're not in a relationship, you have this grace period to grow in preparation for calling in love so that you're not just praying for the right person to come into your life, but you're praying to be the right person when that person arrives. Mm. Um, but I also think that soulmates come in many different forms. And I think that many of us women have soulmates in uh, other women who are on the front lines of transformation. Like you might be my soulmate, mm. right? We're on, we're in a soul tribe. Mm. We're on what I call the transition team. And we're here to elevate consciousness and we're going through a very dark period. So it, you know, life is pushing on us to stand in truth, stand in light. You know, we, we can't afford to be shy any longer. You know, you might feel shy. I still feel shy. And I still just, you know, put my makeup on, comb my hair, brush my teeth and talk to thousands of people. I have to, I have to love that part of me, but that part of me can't lead anymore. Right, because, because the world needs each and every one of us to stand fully in our light and in our true power, the authentic voice of our soul and give our gifts and our greatness because each one of us is, you know, we're, we're, we're so common together. We, we share all these common, beautiful traits, but there's no one like each of us, you know? So the way that light comes through you is a little different than how it comes through me. And the world needs you and each one of us here, whatever we're called to do. I think that sometimes people think that, you know, I have to get the book deal or I have to get the TV show or I have to get on the stage, you know, but the truth is, is that, you know, if you're waiting tables, that, that's, that's you, you, you want to do that the highest and the best that you can be waiting tables, right? So, so wherever we are in life, life is calling on us to, to show up fully in, in our love and in our light and to commit ourselves to learning the terrain of love, to becoming masters of our own inner terrain. So here's how evolution works. You know, just, just what, a hundred and something years ago, you couldn't really get from New York to California in the United States. So it was kind of on the backs of many thousands of people who laid down railroad tracks and, you know, and built something so that now if I want to go to, you know, I'm in California, if I want to go to New York, it's like, oh, I'll just buy a plane ticket and there I am tonight. I'm in New York. That's how consciousness is. And the work of our time is to build these bridges and make these connections internally and bring that into our relationships. A leap is wanting to happen in consciousness, but life can't come down and descend peace upon earth or love upon earth or an awakening. It has to come through us. God can only do for us what God can do through us. So it's through our efforts, our devotion to, to kind of elevate the quality of our connections right here and right now, that is our contribution to seven generations from now. Because that's when, you know, little girls, little boys wake up in the morning and they know their value. They know their truth. They're able to connect in ways that are conscious. They're in a, a conscious we space without losing autonomy. You know, this is, this is where we're going. We have to see this as a place that we're going, where, um, where, where consciousness is something that we're all in together, growing together. Yes, what, what you're talking about is something that I discovered um, on the course of my 
my multiple marriages and multiple <laughs> multiple divorces was it became evident after the last one that I was I was absolutely okay I didn't I didn't I didn't it was actually me who initiated the separation because um I always outgrew my partners yeah, uh, yeah. you know and that was that was that was a pattern um but uh, but I my conclusion after that was was not oh well you know I'm no good at marriage and and I'm not going to find I'm not going to find the one it was well okay I have grown so much in each relationship I am unrecognizable to the person I was before this relationship uh, mm-hmm. at each time and um and now I now I can do it <laughs> now I can do it without having to get a ring on my finger well yeah and I think it's interesting I think we do have to recognize inside of this happily ever after myth that we're still aspiring to because it, it it moves us you know it really touches us and so I love the aspiration for it but I, I think we have to recognize that we're living at a time right now where the old paradigm of marriage was about stability economic security it was about feeding your children it was about populating the earth it was about you know marriage used to be about property it wasn't about love love is the love match is only about 200 years old and i will warn i will tell you that the, the, the people who were against that emerging paradigm what they were screaming was you are going to destabilize marriage you can't build a marriage on something as frivolous as love right so you know we we kind of get it now what they were screaming about that said um that said what we're basically looking at is we have shifted maybe in the last 50 years from the goals of marriage being about stability even in the love match you know our grandmothers they wanted to you know if you think about I mean, my grandparents lived in one house for, what, 40 years, something? That was it. They stayed married forever, no matter what. My grandpa had an affair and a girlfriend on the side, and my grandmother hated it, but she still stayed married. And so if you look, and and even until 1969, you couldn't actually divorce in the United States without dragging your partner through the mud and accusing them of infidelity or abuse. There was no no no-fault divorce so so if you look at now the goal of marriage is not stability anymore it's self-actualization so before it used to be you know till death do us part no matter what in in sickness and in health i'll stick by you for the sake of the kids but now the goal of marriage is really i will stay as long as it's in alignment with my spiritual path and my true self and my true becoming. Is that a bad thing? Well, some people will say that's a selfish thing, but if we look at the world, we have to admit that what the world needs now is not necessarily more children. What the world needs now are women who've come radically alive and who are unleashed with their gifts in the world. So, you know, so life is changing. And ideals are changing. It's a very important conversation because unless we see things in the larger picture, what's thinking me? Whose values am I holding myself accountable to live? Are they my values? Is that what life is actually requiring of me right now? You know, then we can spend our, uh, way too much time in shame. And, um, you know, I'm a fan of guilt and shame to the extent that you look at what have I done that has been selfish and hurtful? What am I going to do different now? What are the amends I need to make to myself, to another person, to you know those coming after this person? Sometimes the mistakes we make with people, we can't go back and correct it with that particular person. Maybe they never want to talk to us again. But you're more conscious moving forward in how you deal with everyone as an amends. You know, so we're using our feelings to inform how we need to grow and sometimes that growth is a moral awakening you know wow i you know had that affair because i thought well it's good for me so it must be good for everyone or we weren't even thinking of other people we were just thinking of ourselves and the passion in the moment and then we saw the consequence of that 
you know, so there's all sorts of ways that we're, we're, we're pushed on to grow and learn from our mistakes. Um, but, but to keep things moving forward and allow our mistakes and our lessons learned to kind of imprint at the deepest level of our soul. You know, one of the reasons we don't get over, oh, excuse me, one of the reasons we don't get over a broken heart and we move into prolonged grief, certainly we make disempowered meaning, I'm no good at relationships. But I also think that we don't find a way to, to make meaning uh, that is large enough to contain the suffering. Every suffering we endure must find an equal or greater meaning. And that's what completes suffering. You know, it's, it's, it's being able to, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think even conscious uncoupling was my way of making meaning out of the disappointment of losing my marriage. And since I was the one to leave, the, the, the many feelings of guilt that I felt about that or feeling, you know, noticing that that was hard for Mark. So I had to make something beautiful of it. And certainly I, I did my best to uh, create my happily even after family, which is what we have. So my daughter never came from a broken family. I mean, we, we did, you know, I'm, the step five of conscious uncoupling is about the structures of how you design the structures in the aftermath of divorce. So I did a downward mobility thing and I went into an apartment complex with my husband four stories down. So he had an apartment, I had an apartment and our daughter just went, you know, and we had dinner together a lot and shared holidays. And you know, we just decided to keep our family intact in its new form so there's all sorts of creative ways that we're finding to do that so the children don't have to suffer and you know carry this image of you know brokenness and they you know if children come from a, a home where the parents are some something's broken between them even if they're polite they're emotionally homeless so, so we have to do our work we can't skip over this if we don't want to hurt our children. And we have to be careful because children look like they're fine when they're not actually fine. So we have to really be willing to be the ones to complete things consciously. Some people say when they hear that, yeah, but I had a narcissistic husband and he's vicious and he's mean and he's selfish. You go, I understand, but you know, it only takes one person to elevate the consciousness of a connection and just assume that you're on the enlightened saint path in this lifetime and you chose it and you chose to marry a narcissist out of, you know, some misguided idea that you were invisible or you thought that that was going to, you know, give you coattails to ride on so you didn't have to deal with your own lack of confidence. You were going to go with someone who had an overabundance of confidence. <laughs> so, you know, whatever, whatever crazy decisions we make and then make a child with, with that person sometimes you know, we have karma to clean up. So we just let it elevate us and we, we stay generative of a positive future for all. So I teach people how to do that in conscious uncoupling. I can't go into it. We don't have enough time right now, but, but, but we're all, we're all on the journey of really being leaders of love. Everyone here is a leader of love. And uh, we never want to give someone with a lesser consciousness than we have permission to be the leader in our relationship such a, such a beautiful way of um allowing us to evolve so that children don't get that um bro brokenness that i personally experienced i don't know if you if if, if, if as you, a child as a child you did yes yeah yeah and it and it, 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 take, it, it can take decades and decades and decades 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 De yeah. If at all, if you're fortunate. If at all, if at all yes. You t it t takes a lot of consciousness and a lot, and a lot of self-work. So um, let me just put the spotlight back on the, on the current cl climate, the, the global climate that, that we're in, not just the pandemic, but we, we've been in, a, we've been in a, a, a catalysis for some time, and it's just that the, the pandemic has made us now look, look right at the issues and what what i'm seeing catherine is 
you come you were talking earlier on about making meaning how how vital it is to make meaning of our lives of what we do of making meaning of our day uh, of our of our projects of our creativity or all, all of it and that for me um came back into focus when when this pandemic started and i started to think about victor frankel and and his his work of of, of giving meaning to the most um ho horrific horrific conditions but nevertheless the principles that that he had are ones that i think are so so valuable right now but what if what if and this is actually something that that i'm actually experiencing myself is what if as you evaluate your own or you you find your own new values in this time whether it's deciding to learn survival skills who knows <laughs> we might have to or or deciding that you know um we just that we're just going to put the blinkers on and 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 carry on as if nothing's happening. We we are reevaluate reevaluating evaluating our values. What happens if all of a sudden or even gradually those va values with somebody that you've been that you've been with for a long time start to be different because of this new world paradigm that we're shifting into? Yeah. So in other words, it's kind of it's asking us to step up even more with the work that the work that you're doing. I think what you're pointing to is that evolution is expedited right now and how uh, how I've, I've studied spiral dynamics, which is Don Beck's work. And um, we're talking about uh, values, memes, memes of values that he really kind of he color codes them and he really shows you the differing value systems that different cultures are in and, um, and, and kind of maps out the pathway of evolution. So what's happening right now is first of all, the world and different countries, different parts of the world are in different values memes. And it's, what, it's the biggest breakdown. So the biggest breakdown in the human experience is exactly what you're talking about. And it does happen in our intimate relationships right now, one of the things that drives evolution is the sharing of ideas. So even since the internet was created, evolution is happening faster, 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 faster. So in our lifetime now, we have been through several shifts of, of, of values memes. And um, you know, and, 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 and for those who, who aren't quite tracking the conversation, a values mean might be family first, right? Family first, good old fashioned, our ideals about the 50s, or, you know, a values meme is, <clears throat> you know, a, a work hard your whole life and, you know, stay at your job and then you get to retire and have a nice, like whatever that values me even what we were talking about before stay together for the sake of the kids that's a values meme so the shift into self-actualization first is a very big shift in values so how to do that without becoming a narcissist right self-actualization in service to the evolution of consciousness in the world not just in service to my good pleasure which which is of danger to what, what Don calls the green meme, which is kind of the, which is probably where many of us are, which is kind of the values of inner development, the values of everyone has an equal say at the table, you know, really beautiful values, but of course the shadow side is, and you know, the internal authority as opposed to, I do this because the church tells me to do it, right, the authoritarian. So so we have to, to look at, um, also be be aware of the kind of shadow of that which might be narcissism well i'm you know if it serves me then it serves everybody which i've been guilty of and that's how i learned that and that's how i learned about moral development is when you act that way you actually hurt people so um so what about outgrowing your partner well there's there's two things to do about that does it invalidate the history of your relationship or the viability of your relationship, not necessarily. Because when you graduate to a new level of values, 
you don't abandon the former values, right? So you still have a part of you that loves family, for example, that values tradition, that, you know, kind of all for one, one for all. And so maybe you sit in deep inquiry together and you, as long as you're interested in and respectful of and feeding power to each other, I think you can stay in a relationship even though you're in two different value systems. It's a bit extra effort, but I think the key is respect. You know, people think, oh, to do happily ever after, you have to love someone for the long haul. Well, yes, but actually the truth is you have to respect them for the long haul, right? No, you can't... I, 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 mm. That, 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 that I, 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 I totally, totally agree. Um, my, my, my current partner taught me um, a, prin a principle that he learned from R Rumi um, in the principle of one and one makes three, uh, which was, was Rumi was the first person to, to write about that in that when you come together in your strength and your power and your genius and, and all the, and your essence and all that you are, and then you see you see another equally in their power that that makes this third entity, which he called the beloved. And I, and I absolutely, I absolutely love that idea. This third, this third person, almost that the beloved, because it, it it takes it away from the personal, and and makes it well. What what's happening with the beloved right now? You, you Isn't know, that beautiful. Yeah. And and Rumi was the one who also said, "Is it true that the one I love is everywhere?" Mm -hmm. And I think when we're talking about the awakening of consciousness, we're talking about that phenomenon so that there's a field that we're inside of. I'll tell you the, the closest I've ever seen of it, and I didn't see it even personally, I heard of it, was after 9-11 and we're coming up on the, I think we're at the 20th anniversary. And I think probably just right around the time that this is coming up for people. So uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, what happened for people, and I've heard personal accounts of this, is that for several weeks after, the, the folks who lived in that part of New York City were allowed to be in that part. A lot of people were roped off and they couldn't go there. But the people who lived there, and the people who lived there they were just walking in such a field of compassion and relatedness that if someone like was elderly and holding a bag of groceries, somebody would just walk up, take the bag and walk them home. No big deal. Effortless. Like almost like a ballet. And they said it was one of the most holy, sacred, beautiful experiences they'd ever had. And I think the hunger for all of our striving is that. So when we do this in our relationships, you're talking about this beautiful, conscious relationship you're having. That's what we're looking to protect. And remember, that's a conditional phenomenon. That depends on certain awakeness in us, certain capacities. Where we lose footing is when we go into the ordinary, which are projections. You know, a lot of us are like, why do I keep repeating that same pattern, that phenomenon? Oh my gosh, I married my narcissistic mother, right? So how does that even happen? Well, that really is happening, not because of the other person, but because of how we are still inside of the consciousness of being the co-narcissist or the co-wounded, or we're still in the woundedness Consciousness, the meaning that we made, I'm alone, I'm not good enough, I'm not safe, and how we show up, how we project that out, we interpret whatever's happening through that lens unconsciously, we then show up in a way that is generative of that dynamic, happens outside of conscious awareness. So when we're talking about the inner development, we're talking about intercepting that unconscious process. And the biggest trigger, of course, is disappointment. We're all enlightened when we're getting what we want. 
It's when we're not getting what we want. It's when the other person just did something so insane that we can't believe they just did that. What were you thinking? And we default into, see, I can't count on anyone. See, I am all alone. See, nobody cares about my feelings. And then we start generating the connection from there. So it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, when I was first driving a stick shift, you know, you had to go first gear, second gear, then third gear. You, you have to break it down. But then, you know, within a matter of weeks, you're kind of speeding along the highway and, you know, then you just like, they're all, they're all one. You can get to a place where it's all one. Oh, I see. I just went into the I'm alone. What else might be more true? Oh, that, that this person just, you know, had a moment where they weren't thinking. But if I ask for what I want, they'll do whatever, you know, they can to support me because they're committed to me. Oh, right. Right. So, so you wake yourself up and you act consciously and you navigate your union consciously. So we're, we're in these intimate relationships with our partners, with our children, with our friends, with our parents who are unconscious still and still, you know, haven't maybe grown alongside of us, but we get to practice with whoever life has put in our path, our coworkers, our boss, and we get to practice staying awake and being conscious and being generative of greater levels of understanding, cohesion, accountability, integrity, uh, good, good, uh, goodwill, all of these things that create health in relationship, good, sane boundaries, clear agreements, all of these things that we're working on. Because imagine if enough of us woke up how we might begin to solve climate change together, mm -hmm. right? How we might begin working together if we were able to not need a trauma and a tragedy like 9-11 to wake us up to living in a field of relatedness as though it were as common as breathing. And I think that's where life's wanting to go. And what we're doing essentially right now, you know, people are losing heart and in a lot of despair. And I just say, you know, this is the bottom of the paradigm of separateness. And all the frustration we feel just trying to get something fixed on our computer. How hard that is, how separate each part is. Well, you're not at the right department after an hour on hold. You have to go over here. How people are not, you know, this is separation at its worst, right? And when, and where flow is, is in the field of relatedness. So those of us who are here, who are reading, who are listening, you know, who are striving, that's what life is bringing forth through us. And that's the North Star. So no matter what the breakdown, you think, okay, how is this an opportunity to express more love, to grow my compassion, to grow kindness, to grow consciousness? How is love wanting to move through me right now and grow through me and come into the planet through me right now in this moment where I'm frustrated, where I'm in breakdown, where I'm scared? How am I being invited to grow? so that we can all become a home for the love that is the light of the universe to, to come onto planet Earth. You know, it's kind of like that's the game of, of evolution. I think, you know, evolutionary, um, evolutionary enlightenment, evolutionary spirituality, it's really the recognition, and it goes back even, it's in the Talmud, so as, as, as postmodern as it is, it's also ancient which is our job is not to, you know, aspire to get to some abstract heaven after we die. Our job is to download heaven on earth and to grow ourselves capable of actually living that. Will it happen in our lifetime? Um, I don't know. I mean, that would be amazing if it did. I, it's, it's in the mystery. But any, any, you know, aspiration that is worthy of us is really going to be 
you know, we're, we're surrendered to it might not happen in our lifetime. We're contributing this to future generations. Mm, I love what, what you said about flow being about related, relatedness, because a lot of a lot of about a lot of preeminence and and the, and the nine graces of preeminence and and the fem, and the feminine high performance model is is, is about is about optimizing flow i've never heard that before i absolutely love that i think it's really absolutely key in 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 the whole quest for for a life of a life of flow so i would just love to ask you one one last question um Catherine for our our audience who are in in preeminence a lot of change makers you mentioned them several times throughout this conversation uh women in the trenches out there the people helpers helping the people and doing doing this work that is so needed right now more than ever before in this bottom of the paradigm time is what if you could go to the top of the top of the empire state building and you had a megaphone that that could reach as many people as possible what would you say <laughs> and somebody says right you've got two minutes to say what you want your message to humanity what would that be wow okay well you've given me an opportunity to talk about it this whole time um one of the core components of calling in the one is that the future is not fixed mm -hmm. and that we have the ability to cause a future that is both unpredicted and unpredictable and unprecedented that will not happen unless we stand for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that very often we dim down our uh, expectations of the future according to our current circumstances, certainly according to the past, and that most of us have an identity that is wrapped up in what happened to us in the past. But if you're talking about transformation, you're, you want to begin to stand for a future that would be completely unreasonable, completely unexpected. So I'm going to stand for a future that uh, seven generations down the line, uh, people are, uh, there, there's one, you know, there, there's, there's a, a there's, there's a world where people around the world are living in this field of relatedness, right? I'm going to just stand for that future. And maybe seven generations down the line is even too far out. Let's say three generations down the line. Because you want a future that's going to actually cause you to rise yourself. Well, who would I need to be in order for that future to happen? What would I need to give up? What would I need to begin to cultivate and grow? And what's my next step? And remember that the journey of a thousand miles begins with the next step. So this is the only game that I think is worth playing right now, is to stand for a bright future for humanity, to stand for a, 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 a healthy planet where this is kind of, you know, look, when the alcoholics in the gutter, the future doesn't look bright. But it's the gutter period that allows for the transformation to happen. That's all that's happening right now. But it's not a passive observance. It's an active one that is demanding that you and I lean in, stand for that future, live into that future, and begin identifying ourselves as the leaders of love living into that future. That's my message. I think we'll, we'll we will weigh that that word well love um ab absolutely thank you for being such a beautiful channel for this wisdom that so many people need to hear right now and for and for your light in the world um it it is truly it isn't just about relationships it, it is such a bigger such a bigger picture it is part of evolution um, I'm absolutely honoured to have you in the magazine and uh, we are going to share all of your links, the books, everything in there. So we, we don't need to, no need to do that. That's all going to be 
um, that's all going to be taken care of. So I just want to say a huge thank you and um, I'd love being in, in, your, in your space and in your, in your universe. It is such a part of preeminence um, and the whole and the whole preeminence ideals. So thank you for being the grace that you are, the grace of relationships. We haven't got that one in there. I've got nine graces. I haven't got new relationships. In. I think wow. I might have, I think I might have to, I think I might have to add on a new grace. Just... Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be a part of your community. And I love you too. I love what you're doing and all the light and love you're creating. Thank you.